So welcome to the residential purchase agreement. Uh, the rollout of this agreement is effective December of 2021. So you will see this just automatically. There's no update button that you're going to press. It's automatically going to update your zip forms. And it's gone from 10 pages to, do you know how many pages it is now? 16. With four supplements. So there's a lot of changes. And a lot of things have been moved around. And there's some really cool stuff that's been added. And we're going to take the next hour and a half to go through and review this agreement. Uh, did you know that our California Association of Realtors, that membership that you pay for, there is a board and the board, a governance board over all of our forms. And their job is to review the forms. And they do that twice a year. Okay. Usually around April. And then again, in November, December, I see updates. And this is not the only form that's been updated. Uh, the, the residential listing agreement will be updated. The buyer representation agreement will be updated. There's several new forms I'll be talking to you about as well. This is not the only form that's been updated. But in my opinion, it's the one that most affects you. And when you have issues and you go to your lead or you go to your coach and you can't solve them and you go to me, like the first thing I do is I'm going to look through your residential purchase agreement and try to find paragraphs to describe your situation. And that way we have a mutual agreement between buyer and seller on how we're going to resolve it. So you knowing that will help you get ahead of a lot of issues and challenges that are associated. Does this make sense? All right, let me share my screen. Will it be available in Skyslope? Yep, it'll be available in Skyslope. Marcos, thank you for asking. Skyslope will automatically update with all the new forms and it'll just automatically happen. Okay, I am sharing my screen. Give me a thumbs up if you can see the new purchase agreement. Can you see it? All right, I got a thumbs up. All right, so let's start at the top. Uh, this is the California Purchase Agreement, Residential Purchase Agreement, and Joint Escrow Instructions. Did you ever catch that part? The fact is that this contract is your instructions to the title company. It is your instructions for escrow. So it's both a purchase agreement and joint escrow instructions that both the buyer and the seller and the agents and the brokers are all telling the title company what to do and how to do it as a result of this document. Uh, as I've mentioned, this form has gone from 10 pages, if you look at the bottom of my screen, to 16. Remember your old one was 10? Now we have 16 pages. Um, let's start with the, the very first line, paragraph one. Linda, jump in as you find things that you want to address. Number one, in 1A, do you see it? It says offer. This is an offer from, guess what? That's going to be your buyer. You're going to put your buyer's information in. So if you've got a buyer's name, you put it in there. If you've got a corporation, Acme Real Estate, Wiley Coyote wants to buy a house, put in Acme Real Estate in there. Uh, if it's a trust, catch this, you need to put in the name of the person, comma, trustee. It's the one deviation, okay? Because a trust can't buy property on its own, but a trustee is empowered to do that. Now, in the event that names run long, and can that happen? Totally. You get three parties. You got mom, dad, brother, sister, aunt, uncle, cousin. So this will automatically generate what's called a TOT. Do you know what TOT is? Text over... Pardon me, a TOA, text overflow addendum. It's going to automatically populate that. The, the difference between an addendum and an amendment is you use addendums only with the purchase agreement when it's submitted over. Every other time after the document's been ratified, you use an amendment. Know that. It's very important. Addendums can be accompany this. That's why you have a text overflow addendum. But after it's ratified, you go to an amendment to the contract. Very important that you know that there's a prescribed timeline on the amendment. Uh, so if you have a trustee, their name would go there. And then, of course, you would use that RCSD. If you don't know what that is, it's called a Representation Capacity Signature Disclosure, which says, hey, 
I'm authorized to sign on behalf of the corporation, the trust. I'm the administ administrator of probate. And all of that can be populated later, later, providing validation that they are who they say they are, and they have the authority to do what they say they want to do. Uh, let's go on down to section B, and you'll notice the property to be acquired is, and you can put in the property. And now look at this change that's happened. The original purchase agreement says assessor's parcel number. Now this one says number or numbers. And then you know why they did that? It's because of Senate Bill 9. Remember this, where we can do lot splits now on property. Actually, in California, single family residential is outlawed. It's You can't have R1 zoning. And so you could have a property that's being sold with multiple parcel numbers. And so you'll want to know that. How can you tell that? Well, you'd be able to tell that from tax records on the multiple listing or a preliminary title report can give you that information. And so it's designed to accommodate lot splits. Very, very important. Um, and it says here, this is new. It says postal mailing address may be different from city jurisdiction. Buyer is advised to investigate. All right. So paragraph one, what changed? Do you remember what used to be here? Purchase price. Remember what else used to be here? Close of escrow. Those have all been moved. And you're going to see later on where they've been moved to. So this is one of the reasons why I'm really glad you're attending this course, because you're going to know where they've been moved to rather than meeting with your client in a conference room, excited to make an offer on a property, and you can't find where to put the close of escrow date or the purchase price. Linda, anything you want to add into paragraph one? Uh, by the way, I'm putting a book in your chat box, which takes, it's about 100 pages, and it'll take this purchase agreement and a book on describing every paragraph and all the adjustments. You copy, paste that later. Don't look at it now, but later on, you can get that in the chat box. Uh, let's say Julianne says, be sure the name of the buyer is what is on their ID. You have a Bobby, and it's really a Robert. Yeah, you're right. It's problematic because, you know, Julianne, you got a great point, because not only are these joint escrow instructions, hence draft title and deeds, but guess who else gets this? The lender. So you put jo little Johnny as the buyer, and the lender's trying to issue financing to little Johnny, or the title's trying to put little Johnny on, on the deed. You got a problem. So what's the name that you're going to use? on title, what is the name that you're going to use um, on the deed? And that's the name that should go there and it should be their official name or should be the, their trustee acting in the capacity of a trust or a corporation. One more comment, it's often difficult to get financing in the name of a trust and almost impossible to get financing in the name of a corporation. So people tell me, ask me all the time, hey, I want to do an LLC. Well, you're going to have to buy the property individually. Then you're going to have to move it into the LLC. Very difficult to go get financing in the name of a corporation. Remember, in California, we have trustees which have a personal responsibility, a personal note that's attached to it called a promissory note. And they don't allow corporations very often to get away with getting financing, uh, especially oh. with uh, opt with positive with uh, low interest rates. Okay, um, will the cover sheet auto populate? Yep, they should automatically populate. Same cover sheet, so you could use that. A lot of these num these things will populate. What is the cover sheet? Well, type in cover sheet in zip forms library, and you'll see that uh, show up. Okay, let's go on to number two. I know I'm moving fast. Sorry, got 16 pages and only 90 minutes. So you're going to get me on, on speed talk, okay? Keep tightening the chat box and I'll keep looking out for it. Number two, agency. Friends, you got to know something about agency. It is a big, big, big deal. You've always got two parts for agency, disclosure and confirmation. Disclosure, hey, this is what could happen. Confirmation, this is what's happening. Uh, statute says, and previous case law, is that when we don't have proper disclosure or confirmation, uh, we risk violations with the Department of Real Estate, and it's an automatic forfeit forfeiture of your real estate commission. The buyer, buyer or seller doesn't really know who represents who. 
So you got to be clear on this one. And so use the CAR form AD, bottom of the form, it'll tell you who needs to sign it. That discloses, hey, there's a potential I could represent you exclusively, or I could represent both the buyer and seller as dual agent. And remember, dual agency is the brokerage. And so that might be Megan and you know, in, in Sacramento and Roseville and Lincoln, and that might be you in Concord or Richmond, and you're like, you haven't connected together, and it's the same brokerage, we're in dual agency, okay? So you got to be careful with that. Uh, so you can put in seller's brokerage firm and buyer's brokerage firm. Um, how do you know who the seller's brokerage firm is? Look on the multiple listing, it'll tell you. Uh, if you're representing the buyer, then the firm is, and you can use one of two options here, Rick Fuller Incorporated or Rick Fuller Team. Those are your two options. We have a DBA with the Department of Real Estate doing business as, and you can use that. And you can type in the license number, 0187-4995 is, is our brokerage. Um, I have a private license or personal license, I should say. And uh, you should know that you don't want to put that. Uh, Although I, I don't typically go out and write offers or even take listings anymore, I help our team members do that. But I, I do have a license as an individual broker, and then we have a brokerage. You'll want to use the brokerage, and Linda's right. Use the 0187-4995 uh, representing you. And then you say, hey, I represent the buyer or the seller exclusively, um, or we represent both of them within the brokerage, and that's called dual agency. Ah, look at section C, very important. They added this new one. It's called an ABA form. What's an ABA form? It is an additional brokerage agency form. So in a rare circumstance, you're doing, uh, uh, you're, ta you're writing, a, uh, you're taking a listing or working with another brokerage. Now we're not talking about agent, we're talking about brokerage. You can use the C additional broker acknowledgement form. If you ever get into that situation, and occasionally it does happen, you ought to be aware, uh, you, ought to, you ought to thread me in on that to make sure that we're on the same page. It can get really, really complicated really, really quickly. Where I see it most is you got an agent in San Francisco and he says, hey, I, I can't make it out to show properties in, in Oakley or Brentwood or Concord. Can we work together? I'm not gonna do a referral fee, but we'll represent the buyer together. We, that would be an additional brokerage, and we got to be really careful with that. I'll show you how to do that. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Linda, is there anything I need to address in the chat box? No. All right. <laughs> I did. All right. Thank you, Linda. Anything on confirmation of agency you want to add here? Not yet. Just down further. All right, let's go to C, uh, section D rather. So we're in, still in agency. We're in paragraph two, section D. It's very important that you know that you include the possible representation of more than one buyer or seller. Um, and it's so important that the California Association of Realtors has pre-checked that box for you. Like, you need to check this. Let's go ahead and do it for you. And so when you're writing an offer, you want to include that RPA. It's, uh, pardon me, that, uh, that possible representation of more than one buyer or seller. If you're representing a buyer, you need to let them know it's possible I could represent more buyers or more sellers in the community. Like it's possible I could write an offer for you and for somebody else. Representing the seller, you could say it's possible I could represent you and the homes down the street. And you may not know of that circumstance. But you need to make sure the client knows that it's possible. This form originated as a result of buyer's agents that would write multiple offers on the same property for different buyers. And the buyers came back and sued the real estate brokerage and said, wait, I didn't know that you also represented another buyer on the property. I thought you worked for me exclusively. And this form became the result of it. This form is found in their zip forms library under library under PRBS. Okay, ready for paragraph three? This Rick, one comment on that. Um, yeah. They made mention that there's now six pre-attached disclosures. So I I know this one has the checkbox, but I'm not sure if the other ones all have the checkbox or if when you check it, it automatically attaches. It automatically attaches, 
and so it will be included in this package that you're going to get when you load this form. You are correct. That's a great point. And along with six others, like buyer's advisory, like agency disclosure, these are all included. You, you run long on that initial line. Remember the line up front with the name? The text overflow addendum is going to come in, right? Okay, let's go on to paragraph three. And we've, we're now calling paragraph three, the grid. Like this is the grid iron. This is where all your data goes. If you remember paragraph three A and three B were in the original purchase agreement, the one you used last week, it's in paragraph one. Now they're all in paragraph three A. I like this. I, I, man, I can't tell you how many times I've flipped through a residential purchase agreement and you got to look through 10 pages to find five things you want to know. Now they're all found in this grid. And the first one is purchase price. And you can put in the purchase price in section 3A. And notice that you can put in the purchase price. And now you can check that it's all cash. You can check that it's all cash. I'll talk about good faith in just a moment when we get to that paragraph. But everything in this purchase agreement is based on good faith. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're getting a loan and, and they're going to fund the deal with cash. It means that they're all cash and that they have got liquidity to do that. Section B, 3B, is close of escrow. And uh, being able to schedule a close of escrow. And you've got two options here. You could say something like 30 days after acceptance, or you could pick a date. 30 days from today would be what? January 1. That's a perfect example. But would you really want to close escrow on January 1st? Say no, because the title companies aren't going to be open. Your lender may not be in town. So this would be a perfect example of using a 30 days after acceptance or selecting, ah, let's push this out to January 3rd, January 4th, January 5th, or closing December 28th or whatever. But it's important that you know that you have these two options. Now, this is a great time to kind of talk to you about days. Do you notice in paragraph 3B, it says days after acceptance? We go down to paragraph 3C, it says calendar days. We go down even further into section, oh, where is it? 3D1, and now it says business days. So you got days, you got calendar days, and you got business days. They're all different. They all mean something different. You need to know what they mean. Calendar days means that any day that's open for business, that could be Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, those are calendar days. And you could end, you could have a calendar day that ends on a Sunday and it'll revert to a Monday. Or in the case that I gave you, January 1st is a holiday. And if you put in 30 days and you were to close escrow on January 1st, then what will happen is it'll roll over to the next day to January 2nd, just by putting in 30 days. Those are days after acceptance. And notice it's days after acceptance. So the best way you count that is to use today as day zero. Today's day zero, tomorrow's day one, following day's day two. And it's after acceptance, not after your offer has been submitted. Once it's been sent, signed, and confirmed right? Like you got to have all three of those. Your, your client has to sign it, they have to sign it, and you got to confirm receiving it or at least having received it. And then those days after acceptance start. So you got two choices there. Calendar days are, they are just days. They can end on a Sunday. They can end on Christmas day. They can end on New Year's. Like it, those are calendar days. You could make an offer expire 10 a.m. on Christmas morning. You, you could absolutely do that. And business days are just that. They are days that are generally open for business. So if you wrote an offer, let's say on Thursday, and it was accepted Thursday night, and you received confirmation of acceptance, remember then Thursday would be day zero, then Friday would be day one, but now we're not going to count Saturday. We're not going to count Sunday. Monday would be day two, and Wednesday would Monday would be day two, and Tuesday would be day three. 
and that's business day. So you need to know those things. And then you can look into the form that I've given you in the chat box that'll further define this in case you didn't track with what I was saying, okay? Or you need more information. So number, section 3B, close of escrow. We've talked about that. Section 3C, expiration of offer. And notice you got these little paragraph numbers that provide further information about what this means. So you can go to the, this paragraph, paragraph 5 and 5B in this purchase agreement or 32A when it comes to expiration of offer or 5A when it comes to deposit. And there's further information on what that means, okay? So that still exists. Uh, let's go on to initial deposit. I, I love this change because probably one of the most underutilized strategies in writing an offer is the increased deposit. And so the idea is that you can make an initial deposit now. And let's, uh, we always advocate that your deposit should be between one and 3%, depending on the competitiveness of the property. So if you're buying an average priced home in our community, it's 500,000. Maybe you make an initial deposit of 1%, which would be $5,000. And then maybe you want to do an increased deposit in two weeks, once all the contingencies are lifted. And now we increase it by an additional 10,000. But now notice in section five, uh, pardon me, section three, D1, you could also put a percentage of the purchase price. Like have you ever written an offer and you put in 3% and then all of a sudden you've changed the price up or down and now you've got either a violation of liquidated damages or you don't really have 3% anymore. You got like 2.8 or 2.9. Now you can say, I'll put 1% or, and I'll follow up with an increased deposit at 2%. Uh, or you could just put it all in an initial deposit. And of course, it now defaults to wire. And that's really important that the buyer is responsible to wire the money because you are not a part, you and I are not a party to the transactions. Very important. We're not the principals. We're not a buyer or seller. So you collecting that money in the form of a cashier's check or cash, it's really problematic and requires you run it through a trust log. If that ever happens, bring it to my attention and we can address that. So section 5D and 1 and 5D2 talking about the deposit. And notice in section 5D2, you can say, hey, I I'm going to increase the deposit upon removal of contingency. So we can actually target a, a, a timeline or an activity or an event. Or you could just simply check the box and put in a date. You should know if you don't check the box, it's really challenging. Like it's important if you're going to use increased deposit, you check that box. Upon removal of all contingencies, you don't want that. You want it to be on a certain date. Maybe they got paid or, or their, their home closes escrow, whatever. Check that box. Don't leave the box unchecked. It creates a dispute. We have to resolve it later. Okay, that's a lot on deposits. If you have any questions, put them in the chat box. Linda, anything do you want to add to that? All right, you ready for uh, Actually, there is the, the new form. Ah, thank you. For so the much. increased deposit. Yeah, that's form DID, the DID form. You got to use it. Why do you need to use it? Because the initial deposit was included in liquidated damages, how disputes are handled in real estate. You do it in an increased deposit, it may not be included in liquidated damages. So use that DID form. And now that initial deposit and the increased deposit will both be incorporated into liquidated damages. You have a dispute in real estate and that deposit is that question, you'll wanna make sure you got the did form and that can be found in section D2. Good point. Okay, we're on to section E1 and now look, we got loan amounts. And uh, once again, the contract has also allowed us to put in a loan amount. So you can put in whatever amount the loan's gonna be. And you can also put in a percentage, which I think is totally cool now. So, you know, uh, we were talking yesterday at our, our team meeting about the loan limit increase. And Danielle was talking about properties in Contra Costa County that could be purchased at a million dollars with 5% down. So you could say, I'm going to do a loan amount of 95% of the purchase price, or 
80% of the purchase price or 96.5% of the purchase price. That's going to be my loan amount. You can also check fixed, uh, it defaults to fixed rate, but you could change it to initial rate and you could put a percentage there of a rate not to exceed. Let me pause right here because this is one that we've not had much of an issue with. Interest rates fluctuate based on the Fed and based on treasury notes. Okay, they're tied to treasury notes, especially the 10-year treasury note. Yesterday, Jerome Powell talked about increasing the Fed rate and increasing those treasury notes. And the idea is that we've been stimulating the economy by keeping things interest rates really low. Imagine you enter into a contract, maybe you do an extended close, 60, 90 days, that interest rate that they were expecting went from 4% to 5 or 4% or 4 to 6%. By you putting this in here, you create a form of contingency that if that interest rate ex exceeds the amount my buyers uh, are anticipating, I can now cancel the contract under the loan contingency. Very, very important. When you leave it blank, you're saying, we're writing an offer today, and I don't care where the contingencies, wh where the interest rate ends up, we're buying the home. Very dangerous. Interest rate goes up, payment also goes up, and affordability for most people goes down. And if you're on the verge of not being able to qualify based on some increase of the interest rate, you should be putting in some parameters there. Uh, notice this too. It says if FHA or VA is checked, there's a deliver of a list of required repairs. And we'll talk more about that in 5C1, especially that VA offer may require a section one clearance, may require a section two clearance, may even require a, a roof clearance or a fence to be repaired, not uncommon on a VA offer. FHA used to be the same way, but it seems to be a little more accepting of repairs today. And so then you'll check whether it's FHA or VA, um, the forms FVAC or HID are included or seller financing. Or maybe there's another form that they're planning to finance it, right? Another way they're going to buy the property. If you use seller financing, especially if you're representing a buyer, we then outsource that seller financing to local attorneys to draft the notes and terms. Very important that you would know that. You check seller financing, and that may be something in the future you want to do. We would outsource to a local attorney to help you write that note and terms. You say, but Rick, there's a seller financing form in the, in the zip forms library. Yep, but there's no promissory note. And there's a lot of details that are left out in that document. So that's where a local attorney can help you write that seller financing when a seller is going to do a carryback financing. Okay, hope all that makes sense. Let's go on down to E2. We're on paragraph three, E2, additional financing. Okay, now I'm going to do a second loan. Uh, I'm going to do some other type of financing. I'm going to have the seller carry back 10%, 15%, 20%, whatever. There it goes. Put it into E2, that secondary financing. Let's look at E3. This is uh, a new pertaining to, uh, pertaining to the grid. We've never asked if it was a secondary home or not. Do you remember what we asked on the original purchase agreement? We asked whether they intended to occupy it. That's what we asked. Now they're saying, is this primary? That's what it's going to default as. Secondary, second home, or investment. And you can check that. Now, where might that be relevant? Well, it might be relevant when you write an offer on a property when there are restrictions that, al that don't allow secondary homes or the lender wants to know what type of financing that you're going to qualify. You don't always have the same financing buying your primary residence as you do a second or investment home. Matter of fact, you rarely don't. For example, FHA and VA are off the table in buying a secondary, uh, buying certainly an investment property. Then we have in paragraph F, the balance of the, of the down payment. So now that might be, you know, whatever your down payment is going to be, you're going to put that in. And then we have the total purchase price, okay? 
Once again, the grid can provides an additional paragraph on each of these terms. So when you wanna learn more about them or explain them in further detail to your client, you can use those additional paragraphs to do that. Uh, how about if you plan to buy the property as a second home and plan to use it as an Airbnb? That's what Joy's question is. Great question, Joy. Then I would use secondary property because you can do that with an Airbnb. But there's a percentage that a lender is looking for. And if it exceeds that percentage, it can often be moved into an investment property. So that one there, there is kind of could be either or, to be honest with you, depending on the situation. What I would do is run it by your lender. Can I categorize this as a second home? Are you going to issue me financing as a second home under this circumstance? Or is it a rental property as an investment? And know this, your insurance is going to change, isn't it? Like you go from a landlord, from a homeowner's policy to a landlord's policy to a vacation rental policy. Totally different policies, depending on whether it's primary, secondary, or investment. Great question, Joy. Okay, we're going down to page two. Hey, we're making progress. As you can see, I really enjoy this stuff. Like, this is my wheelhouse. I, I, I have all my contracts in front of me. This is, I enjoy these contracts. Uh, when I sign my own homes and I buy a property, the title company gives me that, this little private conference room to read through everything before I sign. And so I'm a, a little bit of a freak that way. All right, so property address at the top, very important, and the date. Go down to paragraph G1, seller credit. Oh, I love this. Remember this? You had to put this in some paragraph somewhere in the contract, maybe first page or paragraph five and additional comments. Look here. You don't do that anymore. You don't add it to an additional comment. You can actually put the seller credit, if any, right here. So it describes where, what the credit is. You can do a percentage of the purchase price or an actual amount. Hey, I want to have 3% credit back. I want to have 2% credit back. Put it there. Uh, additional financing terms. Maybe there's an additional finance term that you want to apply. Maybe it's a first loan, a second loan, and a portion of seller carry back. Maybe it's a first loan, second loan, and there's some Cal HFA uh, down payment assistant that you're using or whatever the type that you're going to be using could be there. Okay, here's H1. We're looking at verification of all cash, sufficient funds. So here's what we're looking at here is if, if somebody writes an offer and it's all cash, you need to provide verification. What is verification? Bank statement works. Um, if they're buying all cash, it could be a, a, a brokerage statement. And it's really imp imperative that you redact, that you black out the, the, the loan number or any other uh, pertinent information like their address that, or their cell phone number that might be on a statement. But you want to redact that. You don't want to just send that over and have that out into cyberspace with your client's information and that came from your email uh, outbox. So verification of all cash that they have sufficient funds. And here's the way it now reads. The default is that it's attached to the offer. Do you remember the old purchase agreement, what it was? You had three days. Not anymore. Comes with the offer. It becomes yet another supplement for the purchase agreement, you're going to include a brokerage or a bank statement that says they got the cash to buy it all, all cash. Same concept with verification of down payment and closing costs. We said they're going to bring in 20% or 3.5% or 5%. You got to verify it. The default setting is it's attached. Not that you have three days anymore to go deliver it. It's attached. A great way to do this, by the way, is to have a lender write up the report and say, I have verified down payment and closing costs. And that can become a verification, easy way to do it. And you're going to do, you're going to put in the loan application, which basically means a pre-approval letter. You're going to do that. And it could be pre-qualification, it could be pre-approval, it could be fully underwritten approval, and you have the ability to distinguish be between the difference. And most of us know there's a significant difference between pre-qual and fully underwritten pre-approval subject only to a prelim, a purchase agreement, and an appraisal. And so checking that fully underwritten approval uh, increases the strength of your offer. 
Okay, so this is verification, and you can see where it's further described in paragraph 5E, 5B, 6A, 6B. Let's go on down now to final verification uh, of condition. You know this is the verification of property condition. We call it the VP, or uh, the, the most common vernacular is a final walkthrough. Now, notice this. It says five days prior to close. It, it doesn't say within five days. It says on that fifth day prior to close. And so if you're okay with that, you should put it on your calendar that I'm going to walk through with my client five days prior to close of escrow and do the verification of condition. It doesn't say within five days anymore, which was what we typically knew it to be. And of course, you use a document called the VP verification of property. And if there's nothing to note, then you leave it blank or write none. And um, when you write something in on that VP, it can cause and often does cause a delay in close because we got to resolve it before you close escrow. Okay, we're in section K. Look at this. You can have an ability to do an assignment. Write the offer and you want to assign it to somebody. Probably the best way to assign this is to assign it to your trust or assign it to your corporation. But in some sense, you could assign it to another party, uh, and that can be a possibility. Buyers who do that are often labeled straw buyers, that they really had no intention of buying the property. Uh, a lot of people have gotten in some trouble be becoming a straw buyer. Straw buyer is when you write an offer as if you intend to buy it, but you never have any intentions. So the assignment request can be a good idea um, pertaining to, I'm going to now move this to my trust or corporation. Scrolling down, we now get to talk about some of our favorite things, contingencies, or I like to call them subject twos. Sometimes people understand that concept, that your offer is subject to or contingent upon. L1, there's your loan. Notice, remember what the old contract said? 21 days. You had 21 days to get the loan. How many days do you have now? Sure. Yeah, that's right. 17 days. That's a change. And if you're writing an offer all cash or you want to go in no loan contingency, you check that box, which is in that third part of the grid. Uh, 8B, look at this one. This is very interesting. Appraisal, also 17 days. And you could remove the appraisal contingency. A lot of people do that in this market. Now they put in this thing that says appraisal contingency based on appraised value at a minimum minimum of the purchase price. Well, yeah, of course, that's what we know it to be. Or, and now you can check the box, or 5,000 above, or 10,000 above, or 15,000 above. Let me kind of speak to you on this. Um, the one area I am disappointed in this contract is right here. I wish they would have gone on to provide further explanation of what that means to a buyer and to a seller. Because there's a lot of confusion when it comes to an appraisal bridge. So what can you do? Well, you, you check that box, you put in the 5,000, the 10,000, the 15,000, whatever it is, and then you include an addendum. And the addendum should have some legal language. Where do you get the legal language? You get it from the CAR legal library. You can also call the CAR legal hotline and they'll write out an addendum for you or give you the language for the addendum. <coughs> and now we have the proper language that defines that or amount. I wish they would have included that language in this purchase agreement. But if you decide to use an appraisal bridge an es or an appraisal escalator, you should have that addendum associated with that, okay? Okay, now we got to the investigation of the property, 17 days. Look at this, got this new paragraph, information access to property. Buyer's right to access the property for information's purpose is not a contingency does not create cancellation right and applies if contingencies are removed. What are we saying? You know, the buyer always says to you, can I go over and measure the living room? I really want to see that garage again. You know, I really am excited about where I'm going to put my TV. Like that's an information to access the property. 
and they're putting in a timeline of which you can do that. Does that make sense? Now, it's not necessarily a contingency that has the contract cancellation rights like loan and appraisal, but they're saying, seller, you're agreeing to cooperate with that. Section AD, uh, pardon me, section L4, review of seller disclosures. Sellers required to give the disclosures within 17 days. What disclosures? Well, of course, our statutory disclosures, our TDS, our SPQ. Um, by the way, when you have a TDS, the third page of a TDS talks about the agent's disclosure known as an agent visual inspection disclosure. Sellers who agents that don't deliver that in a timely manner put their clients at risk for a cancellation of contract because they didn't deliver it within the 17 days. How many people have seen a listing agent that gives it, give the AVID, the agent visual inspection disclosure, like right before close, really problematic. Also review of the preliminary title report where you're going to be able to see liens like Hero and Pace and Solar and maybe propane liens, or you might see utility easements and things. All of that can be found there as well. And you got 17 days to review the prelim. What about this? Common interest disclosure. What's common interest? HOA, Homeowners Association. This might be a common interest disclosure. And so they've got to review a certain set of documents and they've got 17 days to do it. And uh, if the buyer doesn't deliver it, oh, pardon me, the seller doesn't deliver it, notice what the default is on each of these, or five days after acceptance. You got this lazy listing agent, they never ordered the HOA docs, they never worked with their client to get the, T the seller to get the TDS, they never did their agent visual, they go deliver this the week before they're supposed to close, the moving truck is in the driveway, buyer has the ability to cancel. It creates a five-day right of rescission. I'm so glad they put that in writing. It's a very important piece. And of course, we have the sale of buyer's property, also known as a COP form. That COP form also changed. And so you should review that before using it. What is a COP form? This is subject to me selling my property to make the purchase, a COP form. COP form could also accompany a, ten, a seller, a buyer intent to 1031 exchange. It's subject to me selling the property and doing a 1031 exchange on that property. All of that's a contingency based on the sale of another property. Now, a, a, a buyer might say, I want to be bold. Like, I want to get this offer. This is the right home. And I'm going to remove all of those contingencies. And they could check that box. If you notice, it accompanies all the investigation, seller, uh, prelim, all of it. They could check that box, include a CR. What's a CR? Contingency removal form. And you'd want to make it CR1. And you will remove all those contingencies that are now listed on the contingency removal form. Friendly reminder, if you have questions, I'm monitoring the chat box and I'll stop and answer any questions you might have. So let's go on to section M. It talks about possession. Oh boy, this is another pretty sizable change. Remember what the contract says now? Like, hey, the contract says you buy the property, you get the keys, you know, six o'clock on the day we close escrow. Not anymore. The new contract in section M says upon notice of recording, you close escrow at 10 a.m., you get the key and you get an email from the title company. Congratulations, we're closed. That's confirmation of recordation. They get the keys. They get the keys at 10 a.m. or 9 a.m. or 5 p.m. or whatever time that you get notice of recording. So it kind of means that you need to be available to get the keys and arrangements. And certainly the seller needs to know, doesn't he? Or he or she, don't they need to know that they could be having to leave the property at that time. You can default, you can change the default to 6 p.m. or any time, and all that's available right there under section M1, but it's very important that you know that. Uh, how about this? You ever have a property, we do a rent back, and you're always asking me, do I use the SIP or do I do the residential lease after sell, the RLAS agreement? Well, here you go. Now you can say seller is going to stay in the property for up to 30 to, 29 days or fewer or 30 days or more. 29 days or fewer, you're going to want to use the additional addendum, the seller in possession. That's for 29 days or fewer. And if you want to use 
go longer than that, if they want to live in the property for 30 days, then they should use the residential lease after sale. You go from a one-page form to about a four or five-page form. You should know that if you go beyond, on, beyond 59 days, you do jeopardize your buyer's ability to get owner-occupied financing. Very important to know. Okay, so wrapping up page two, uh, document fees and compliance. Like, okay, who's responsible for some of this stuff? Now, look, there's there create some defaults. The seller delivery of documents seven days after acceptance. Remember how you do that? Day today it's been accepted, today zero, then tomorrow's one. And so seven days after acceptance, sellers required to deliver documents. If they don't deliver them, buyer has that five-day right of rescission that we looked at in the previous paragraph. How about sign and return escrow holders provisions and instructions five days after receipt? How about time to pay in order for HOA docs? You ever waited for a seller to pay for those? And they're taking their sweet time before they order those HOA docs. Not anymore. You got to do it within a prescribed amount of time. Defaults at three days after acceptance. How about install smoke detectors or car uh, carbon monoxide um, or water heater bracing? seven days after acceptance, they got to get it done. And so this puts a little bound, and that, I think that's a good idea because how many times have you brought an appraisal through the proper, appraiser through the property and they said, um, no smoke detectors, no carbon monoxide detectors, water heaters not strapped, no gas shutoff valve installed for unincorporated areas within the county or areas that are city, areas that are unincorporated uh, like Bay Point and Discovery Bay uh, and Bethel Island still remain unincorporated and require those types of things. So you're, you've given your client a timeline to do those things that are mandatory government retrofits. And then evidence of representation authority, three days after acceptance. What form do we use for that? The RCSD, the Representation Capacity Signature Disclosure. And it says that you're selling on behalf of a trust or probate or corporate or buying corporation like it, it tells you who whose authority you have and often there are supplements like a court order or a trust that can help uh, provide further evidence these paragraphs most most of these sections in the grid in section n did not exist before i think that they're of value and will eliminate a lot of problems that you have Okay, I'm going back to my chat box. And again, if you have questions, go ahead and monitor that. Uh, going back to tenant occupied, can you talk about someone buying a property with tenants and they want it vacant, but the seller has to give a 60 day notice? Oh, joy, great question. When we go back to uh, occupancy, um, the tenant occupied, like if you're buying a property and the tenants are there, you need to use this T-O-P-A form. It used to be called a TIP, Tenant in Possession Addendum. Now it's called a T-O-P, T-O-P-A. And it says things like you're going to provide a lease and you're going to provide what's called an estoppel, the tenant signing on behalf of the lease terms are accurate. You're going to provide a P&L. You're going to provide rental documents. You're going to provide all these things. But what Joy's asking is, okay, what if the tenant was supposed to be out of the property? The tenant was supposed to be out of the property. You really shouldn't close escrow until the tenant is gone. Because what you're going to do is shift that liability from the landlord and seller to the buyer. If you do elect to do that, then you want to put the lease in the buyer's name. And the TOPA form will help you do that. In the event that the, the tenant has not moved out and it's required that the property be vacant at close of escrow, and you go do that final walkthrough that we talked about five days prior to close, you want to extend the close of escrow. You do not want to close and then assume that responsibility on your buyer. We've seen too many disasters that have occurred in that situation. By the way, more of that can be found in paragraph 7C of the purchase agreement, and it defines it even further. Joy, I hope I answered your question. 
Uh, let's continue on if we have no other questions on page two. Linda, did you have anything further to add? Okay, I'm gonna move a little faster uh, if, you, if that's even possible. Look at paragraph nine. Do you remember um, what's currently paragraph eight of the purchase agreement? But now you get a chance to check some of this stuff. And it says all items specified in 9B are included in the following. And you might have gone through the MLS and said, this is included and this is included and this, none of that stuff matters. This is what matters. So for example, if you don't check stove or oven, it will not come with the property. If you don't check refrigerators or washers or dryers, check this one out. Dishwashers, microwaves, okay? Video doorbells, security system, smart home control devices, electric car charging, potted trees and shrubs. Like your pen should be sharp here and asking your clients, do you want these? Because if you don't check them here, these items are included and by default, they're excluded. And what do you say? I don't want that chicken coop that's in the backyard. Okay, that's where P2 comes in, excluded items. I don't want the chicken coop or whatever it is. Okay, I, I could spend a lot of time on that one. And I think there's a lot of problems here uh, with agents that are moving too fast and a new contract, and then they don't check stove or refrigerator, and you got a contract and they show up and they're really, really disappointed. I thought that was to come with it. So be really uh, pay close attention on paragraph three, page three, paragraph P. Allocation of cost, who pays for what? We've got the natural hazard report, and who pays for that? Um, by the way, it's a good idea the seller pays for it because the seller is responsible to disclosing natural hazard disclosures like fire, flood, earthquake. You'd be really careful outsourcing this one to the buyer because it's the seller's responsibility all the seller is doing is using a third-party source to define that. It's actually a form in zip forms where the seller could make these disclosures. So I would suggest that you keep this as a seller pay item, and that way they're disclosing the zones as they're required to do. How about who's going to pay for the smoke detector, carbon, carbon oxide, and water heater? What about other point-of-sale ordinances? We've got unincorporated areas with gas shutoff valves. You have some communities like San Rafael that require low flow toilets. You have other communities that require sewer lateral inspections. Very important. We identify what those are and who's paying for them. Uh, some of those have got some pretty significant costs. How about this one? Escrow fees. Who's paying what? Buyer, seller? Are they paying the escrow or each to pay their own? Each to pay their own translates to 50-50. That's what that means, okay? Owner's title policy, buyer or seller, who's paying for that? Len a buyer's lender's title policy, guess what? You don't have a choice, buyer's paying it. How about county transfer tax? In, in Contra Costa County, for example, it's $1.10 per thousand, or it's really 55 cents per 500. That's how you calculate it. But what about in other counties? And in Alameda County, for example, you have a city transfer tax. In uh, some cities throughout even Contra Costa, like Richmond, have a city transfer tax. So checking who's going to pay for that. Alameda County's transfer tax is a lot more than their count. A, a lot The city transfer taxes in Alameda County are a lot more than the county documentary transfer tax. Very important for you to know. So check those box. How do you know who, which counties and which cities? Go to your title company. And they'll tell you which cities and which counties have transfer taxes and what their point of sale ordinances are. Okay, who's paying the HOA certification and transfer fees? And how about private transfer fees, which have become a really big problem? Private transfer fees, maybe like an HOA, uh, a, like a small community transfer fee. Some of these communities, you think about the city of Truckee, most of the city of Truckee has two HOAs. Who's paying for that private transfer fee? And so we see a lot more of that today. Who's paying for the home warranty and how much is it going to be? Um, or does the buyer waive it? One of the uh, arrangements I work out every year with errors and emissions is that when our agents select the home warranty and they use our standard forms and they 
use our standard disclosures and they get a home inspection, it cuts your E&O deductible 50%. So they either have to have a home warranty or they have to waive it. If this is left blank, in the event that there's an issue that requires errors and emissions, you will no longer be able to cut that deductible in half. Page three of 16, Linda, anything else that you wanna add here? Okay. I, I put mine, excuse me, I put mine in the chat box. Linda, is there any other comments in the chat box I need to address? Um, no. Okay. All right. Moving on. Paragraph four. Here's a bunch of other addenda or addendums. Remember, use addenda or addendum, same thing, with the contract. Amendments once it's ratified going forward. You want to change something? It's an amendment. Here's some of them. Probate. Manufactured home, home purchase addendum. Tenant occupied property. We should talk, we talked about that. Tenants in common agreement. Okay. Tenants in common purchase agreement. Uh, that would be called like a tick agreement is what it's commonly known. Stock, stock cooperative. You can check these box and then use these forms. Guess what? The probate purchase contract is gone. Guess what? The manufactured home purchase agreement is gone. So it's now using this document and an addendum rather than you having a separate form. What are some of the other addendums you could use? Backup offer addendum. I talk a lot to about how you can use that. Great way if there's an offer that's accepted, your client loves that property, send over your offer, even though it's accepted with a backup offer addendum. Right now, about a third of contracts fall out. If it falls out, you would get your offer and they accept the backup offer addendum, a BUO, you can get your offer accepted. How about septic, well, property monument and propane? Great form to identify who's investigating septic well, who's cleaning it. Um, and, and who's doing a percolation test and who's testing the soil and what about monuments and boundaries on a property that's not clearly identifiable. This is often in rural property. Short sale addendum, court confirmation addendum when you have a probate or a guardianship and seller intent to exchange through the use of a 1031 exchange, you might use those. What other addendums and advisories might you use? Well, you'll notice that they've included the buyer's investigation advisory as standard. The wire fraud advisory is standard. Those are some of the six uh, uh, supplements that automatically come. They're pre-checked. A couple more is the Fair Housing and the Cal Consumer Privacy Act. But here's a few others that you could include. You could include a wildfire disaster advisory. You could include a trust advisory, an REO advisory. You could even include the SBSA or the short sale information advisory or even the probate advisory. These are all addendums or advisories in this case that you can add to the contract based on the circumstance. Okay, paragraph five gets into more about the deposit. Remember what I told you is that when you look at the grid, I'm giving you the terms, but there's more to these sections and can be found in these paragraphs that are listed here. Now we're into those paragraphs. So here it talks about deposit and retention of deposit. Section 5B is whether it's an all cash offer. What does that mean? Section 5 C talks about loan, the first loan and the additional financing amount, the FHA, VA. D, the balance of the purchase price to be deposited within the escrow holder instructions. And section E, I love this one. This one provides a lot of clarification. This is a new one. It talks about limits on the credit to a buyer. What are we saying? It says any credit to buyer is specified or otherwise agreed from any source for closing is agreed to by all parties. You say, Rick, that's nothing new, but this is, shall be disclosed to buyer's lender. We never do any of this stuff outside of escrow. Do it within escrow, it's disclosed. Do it on this purchase agreement. It also says that in the event that you exceed the amount that could actually be used, like you, you were a little aggressive and you put a little too much seller credit, that it's automatically adjusted and the apps uh, and uh, automatically adjusted. And so they, they do not get that money if you overestimate their credit. So talk to your lender before putting in a percentage 
or a number when it comes to seller uh, buyer credits. Uh, additional financing terms. I think we've talked a lot about down payment and closing costs and verification of loan application. And we talked about what that looks like. Uh, and buyer stated financing. Oh, this is a big one. Section 6C says when buyer states financing and buyer changes their mind, they said, I'm, I'm going conventional and, I, and then they change their mind to FHA or VA. Buyer should know that's on them, that this offer was written in good faith. And if that fails, that they should know that they're going to be held accountable to the stated financing. Well, Rick, what happens when we come to the, it didn't fail and we come to a table and everything closes and it's just fine. Well, that's okay. But you, your buyer should know that the seller can hold them accountable to the stated financing. Very, very important. If they stated conventional, and they go VA or FHA, they stated cash, and they try to go financing, be really careful with that. They can pursue it, but the seller is under no obligation to cooperate with that. They can read all about that in paragraph C. We talked about closing and possession, and uh, one of the most common questions I get, and I think you get too, is on, I want an as-is purchase agreement. I want an as-is contract. This is an as-is contract. Paragraph 7B says, unless otherwise agreed, the property shall be delivered as is in its present physical condition. This is an as-is contract. They're not required to make a bunch of repairs to the property. It's an as-is agreement. Okay. Uh, John asks, what could happen? And John, I'm, I'm looking at you. I see on my screen. Why don't you provide a little more clarification of what you're asking me? Uh, regarding uh, uh, holding the buyer accountable if they change their terms, like say, for example, offer all cash and then uh, get a hard money loan, which has happened to me. Yeah, it's totally. So here it says, seller has no obligation to cooperate with buyer's effort to obtain any other financing other than specified in the agreement, but shall not interfere with closing at the purchase price on close of escrow. Buyer's inability to obtain alternative financing does not excuse buyer from the obligation to purchase the property and close escrow as specified. So what it says, John, is a buyer, if they choose to do that, it's up to the buyer. That ball is in their court. If they can't pull it off, they the seller has no obligation to either A, cooperate, or B, to cancel the deal if they can't get this new form of financing other than what was stated. John, let me know. I think I answered your question. Very important. Uh, how about in section C, we're on to seller remaining in possession after close of escrow. We talked about that, didn't we? We said use, if it's 30 days or more, use the RLAS. If it's 29 days or less, use the seller in possession addendum. Uh, here's a kind of a question for you. When would you allow a buyer to move into, prop, into the property prior to close of escrow? It's an easy answer. <laughs> Linda, you, Linda, you're yelling at me in all caps. Yeah, never, you never want to allow a buyer to move into the property prior to close of escrow. It is extremely problematic, fraught with issues. You'll probably never close and you'll be dealing with massive litigation. Um, we, in my career, I've seen it happen just once. The property never closed, and we had to evict the buyer from the home that they were planning to buy and had the greatest reasons of why they needed to move in. You never want to do that. Not even the side yard, garage, anything. It's just, it's so insurances. Think about that. Think about liability. Think about new discoveries that are now made on the property that then you've got to address. Very problematic. Okay, we are down into the loan contingency. I'm moving a little faster, and this further describes the grid. Rick, Each one thing. Yeah. Um, before we move on to that, as as part of a condition for the property on closing. Yes. If the repairs are not complete, 
we still need to close and it would be between the buyer and seller and small claims court. Um, we can't hold up the closing for non repairs. Okay, thank you, Linda. So we're now on to contingencies, and I think we've, I've covered a lot on loan and appraisal when we were on the grid, but I do want to take your eyes down to section um, 8C and 8D, because I think this will be really helpful to you. Um, it says here, the investigation of the property, this agreement is specified as contingent upon buyer's acceptance of the condition of the property and other matters affecting the property, see paragraph 10. 12. And the agreement is as specified continuing on buyer's review of seller's documents. What you should know is that when a seller has a formal, formal inspection, termite, home, roof, whatever, foundation, mold, they're required to disclose that to the new buyer. Here's the exception, an appraisal. An appraisal is an exception to that. They do not have to disclose an appraisal because an appraisal is one person's opinion in one point in time. So they don't need to do that. Here's what you should also know. They are the buyer who does their own investigations and reports and inspections is required to disclose those to the seller. All right. So uh, they're required to give them a copy of the reports and that you're going to see here in the contract. All right, let's continue on. I want to jump to section G. And it says buyer review of leased or leaned items, buyer's review of ability and willingness to assume any lease, maintenance agreement, or other financial obligation to accept the property subject to a lien disclosed pursuant to paragraph 9B. What are we talking about? Can you think of solar? Think of propane? Can you think of reverse osmosis? Can you think of these leased or leaned items that are often found at a pro alarms, it's very common, buyers have an opportunity to review it. And buyers can now review those documents and make a decision uh, pursuant to paragraph 3-7, the timeline that we, we created in the grid on whether they want to move forward. Um, very important, and it's becoming more and more common. Nearly every property we see has some solar, has some ADT security system, that's got a 500 year contract to it, right? <laughs> the buyer doesn't know the terms, doesn't know the amount, doesn't know whatever. And, and here's your opportunity to say, look, I have an opportunity to review it before we close. You ever wonder what happens in sec if they remove all the contingencies or create a cancellation? Paragraph I addresses this. Paragraph J goes back to the contingency of purchase and the COP form and how it's addressed with the sale of buyer's property. Paragraph 9 is an in-depth paragraph that's very much related to the grid. Remember all these boxes we checked and said we want the stove and the refrigerator and the wine refrigerator and the washer and dryer? And, and we want your cat and we want your dog and we want your, your third-born Son, like all of that stuff is defined even further here. A great habit is to take a highlighter and highlight this paragraph and say, buyer, seller, whoever you're working with, read this so you know what comes with the property and what doesn't. Uh, things like window coverings comes with the property, okay? Things like automatic pool cleaners, pool nets, pool covers. Okay, all of this stuff comes with the property. Be really careful with that. Uh, I know in the sake of time, I'm moving quickly, but I'm just trying to give you as much insight as I can. There's also things that are excluded. Here is a really big change in this contract. Do you remember uh, in your current contract, if you wrote an offer and there was a flat screen TV hanging to the wall? Do you remember this? The flat screen TV would go, but the bracket would stay. Do you remember this? This was the default setting. Not anymore. Look at this. Um, unless otherwise specified in paragraph 3P1, the brackets attached to the walls, floors, or ceilings, or any will be removed, and the holes or other damage will be repaired, but not painted. 
So previously, they had to keep the, 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 the bracket there for a flat screen TV as an example. Not anymore. They got to remove it. And they've got to patch the hole, but they're not obligated to paint it. Um, paragraph 10 is the allocation of cost. Who pays for what? Those point of sale requirements, what I call point of sale ordinances. And your title company, you write an offer and say, hey, is there county? Is there city? Is there point of sale requirements, gas shutoff valves, sewer laterals? Your uh, title company can tell you which areas require that. You can also look in our Facebook group. I've posted it dozens of times in there. Section 11 says statutory and other disclosures. What's, what is the seller required to give? Well, here's a whole list. What you should know is that I review this list with your transaction coordinators. Uh, Linda's working on that as we speak for 2022. And we match up all the things that are required. So if you follow our matrix of what we require, these are all, all included, okay? Uh, lead disclosure. Uh, hasn't changed much. Home firing hardening and disclosure. Okay, this is a new law, requires us to disclose that on the TDS. And so very important. Also defensible space disclosure and addendum for any transaction which TDS is required and a property is located in a high or very high hazard area, fire hazard area. There are a lot of people that think the TDS is not I'm sorry, the natural hazard disclosure is not the final authority on that. There's a lot of people that are trying to lean into if the TDS, if the NHD says it's in a high fire, they do this and they disclose this and they use this additional document. And if it's in a wooded area and it's not listed, they still use it. Like you default to using it rather than default to not using it. Tax withholdings pertaining to the FERPTA, we could talk a lot about that. that Megan's Law, disclosure, um, registered sex offenders. You never want to look that up for your client, by the way. Hey, Linda, why don't you look up if there's any sex, registered sex offenders in the neighborhood? Let me know what you think. You don't want to do that because there's going to be registered sex offenders in, a, in any city that you look in and you write an offer. What you want to do is to give it to your client and say, you go look at this website you sign the authorization that you're looking at it for the for the for act, for the uh, purposes in which it's created and then you make the determination whether you're too close uh, we had a situation a number of years ago where somebody moved in and the neighbor was a registered sex offender they looked at the site but didn't pay much attention to it didn't see that neighbor um, or maybe they didn't look at the site at all and now they moved in and their neighbor was a registered sex offender and they sold the home almost immediately. They should look on their own to make their own assessment whether the proximity to registered sex offenders is an issue for them. A notice of regarding gas and hazardous liquid transmission pipes. You'll find this now on your natural hazard disclosure. Condominium plan disclosures, what's required if you follow our matrix or use our title companies. They know what's required and will get you the full set of documents, budgets, bylaws, 12 months um, uh, meetings, uh, the minutes from their meetings and more are all provided there in the condominium. Buyer's investigation of the property. You'll notice that this is all listed here of what the buyer can investigate and how the buyer can hold title, whether they want to do a tenants in common, a, um, a joint tenancy, community property, whatever, sole and separate, buyer, that's up to you. And the buyer should work with the title company to decide. And you ought to be really careful because that's a legal matter. I hear agents all the time. Why don't we do a tick agreement? Well, you should do joint tenancy. You should do community property with right of survivorship. It's really a legal matter. And they ought to address it with an attorney that understands the dynamics of their family and their right of survivorship. And then they can come back and say, yeah, I do a tick or do a joint venture or do a tenants in common or whatever. Um, scrolling through paragraph 14, the time periods, removal of the cancellation, cancellation rights, removal of contingency. Great paragraph if you get to a point where buyer or seller is not responding accordingly. Here's how the seller can cancel and here's how the buyer can cancel. 
notice that it's required that both the buyer and the seller give a notice to perform. We call that an NTP form. And you have to do that before you can issue a cancellation of contract for non-performance. And that, that document, you got to deliver two days in advance, okay? Once you've issued, uh, once we've exceeded the close of escrow, then you go to, instead of a notice to perform, but a DCE, a demand to close escrow. Um, broker's compensation is addressed here, which is often associated with your buyer rep or what was identified on the multiple listing. You'll notice in paragraph 19, join escrow instructions to the escrow holder saying this document is not only our contract, it is our instruction to you, title company. So this is why you don't see the title company reaching out to you and saying, okay, now what do you want us to do? Because they already have the instructions from the residential purchase agreement. Uh, scrolling down, just a couple other comments, and I'll wrap this up. I do want to leave about five minutes uh, for anyone that wants to hang out and ask questions, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll hang out for a little while longer. But here's a couple other things. The MLS, uh, please be aware that when things are disclosed in an MLS, they don't transfer over to the purchase agreement. So if they say, you know, this... Uh, hot tubs included in the sale or this refrigerator or this washer and dryer is included. If you don't check it on the contract, it will not be included. This supersedes or takes precedence over the residential purchase agreement. You say, Rick, where do I get all these definitions? I'm glad you asked. Paragraph 25 gives you all the definitions. You know, when I talked about days and how many days and calendar days and business days and it's all here. Delivery and confirmation, all of it's here. Liquidated damages. I could talk all day about liquidated damages, but it's how disputes are handled in real estate and on a single family residential home. It is up to 3% of the purchase price. For when you get an offer and they put 10% of the purchase price in as a deposit, it does no good. Max liquidated damages, if this is agreed upon, is 3%. Pre decides how damages are handled. Outside of this, can you imagine having to identify the damage to the seller? Like, hey, I got a moving truck and I lost my next home. And, and you know, we did all of this. Like, it'd be very difficult to quantify it. This does that. What's the process that we use in handling disputes? First is mediation. And CAR has an organized me mediation that we can use to handle disputes in the contract. And then there's arbitration. Mediation is not binding, but arbitration is. Mediation is usually an attorney that meets with all parties, try to find common ground. Arbitration will issue a, a arbitration report and tell you what needs to happen. Here's your expiration of offer um, and how many days and what that means. Buyer's signature and a, a section for acceptance. Notice this looks a little different. And if you've got more than two signers, you need to use an ASA form so that it can all, everybody can sign. You don't want to just keep putting in buyer after buyer after buyer. Use that ASA form. And I think you can go up to five buyers that are signing. It's an additional signature addendum. If you're countering the offer, you would use this section. Okay, you could accept it, or you could hit a seller counter offer or a backup offer. Or if you have an entity seller and you want to include the, that RCSD, representation capacity signature disclosure, you can do that there. And here's where you would want to have the seller, if you're a listing agent, initial, I didn't accept this offer. Because the next follow-up question is, Linda, why did you not present my offer to your seller? And you say, yes, I did. Here it is that they've acknowledged not accepting your offer. Sorry, it was no good. <laughs> and finally, the real estate brokerage section, which we can fit, which you will fill out. We've already talked about brokerage and agent and how all that works in the very beginning of this. So I won't go into those details. And then the escrow instructor, instructor will, escrow holder will fill out this confirming escrow has been opened 
and confirming the deposit is in, which they have how many business days? Three. And finally, uh, if you got multiple offers, maybe you don't want to say I'm going to reject it, but you just want to say I presented it, your seller or the agent can initial here. I like the seller. This says that I shared the offer with you, Linda, and I have presented it, which is my fiduciary right uh, responsibility as a real estate agent. I must disclose all offers to my client, regardless of when they come in. Day before it comes in, close of escrow, offer comes in, I got to disclose it. Presentation of offer initial here. Well, friends, I, we did it, Linda. I got four minutes left. Two things. Um, you didn't point out the the new feature where you can designate how they contact you, which is ah. great on my side because sometimes point. I have nothing with their phone number. And the other thing is there is no more um, acknowledgement. They took that out. Okay, so let's let's address those. We're talking about paragraph five right here on par on page sixteen. Notice that you can put in a designated email and phone number so that they communicate with you. So it's like they don't you don't get this email that went to some out in like you get the inbox email that they're monitoring or their cell phone number, and that's listed here. That's a great point. I'm glad you brought that up. That's a designated electronic delivery. And it still requires buyer to sign the offer, seller to sign the offer, and then it requires not delivery, but acknowledgement. You, 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 you need to know that you need to receive it, okay? And email is considered a sufficient way to have sent that over to create the contract. So they don't have to respond back, although it's probably a good idea. They don't have to initial it anymore but you do need to get that back to the designated email. It requires those three steps. Buyer sign, seller doesn't, you don't have a contract. You only have an offer. Buyer signs, seller signs, and they don't get it back to you, you still have an offer, not a contract. Buyer signs, seller signs, and you get a copy of it or the, the agent or the buyer gets a copy of it, you're in contract. All those are three necessary parts. And in a world of multiple offers, you knowing how necessary those are and being able to confirm that you actually got a ratified contract, not just an offer, is a big deal. Good points, Linda. I'm glad you caught me on that. Okay. Uh, I am going to, it is 1128. I'm going to hang out and I'm going to hang out for another 15 or minutes or so. And I'm gonna answer any of your questions. Now, I told you this was 90 minutes and it is, uh, we're two minutes away from that. So if you don't have any questions or you don't wanna hear what other people are asking, you are welcome to log out and go about your day. And I thank you for being here. And I thank you for investing in your education so that you can communicate this to your client. But if you wanna hang out, um, feel free to unmute and ask me any question, and uh, I'll see if I have the answer for it. Um, go right ahead. If nobody's going to ask a question yet, I have a comment. Uh, at the beginning of the contract, it does specifically now say this form is 16 pages, and the parties are advised to read all 16 pages. And at the place where the seller's signing at the back, it says that they have read and received all 16 pages. And my guess is most of our clients are lying. <laughs> I don't think they're reading all 16 pages. Um, and you certainly don't need to take 90 minutes like I did with you, but you should go par you should go page by page and and give a summary of what they're signing and then you should recommend that they read it. And when there are issues, it is the one place we go to time and time again. Because if I can show you in the contract that you have on how to handle this dispute, it's already in writing, and the buyer and seller and the agents have agreed to it, it provides a very clear path to resolution. Uh, not all things are there, but a lot of them are. It's also why you really don't want to 
use a lot of addendums or later on a lot of amendments. These have all been written and vetted by real estate attorneys and provided to you based on um, you know, current legislation. When you take the creative prerogative and write your own addendum or a, own amendment, you're taking risk. So be really careful. That's why we want to use the pre-subscribed forms to communicate this message. All right. Any other questions? Great point, Linda. Yeah, I got one on the, the new, uh, the way they lay out this, the increased deposit on D2. Yes. We can use that as leverage for a stronger offer. Say, hey, I'm going to give you 3%, but I'm also going to add another 10 grand in a week after acceptance. Is that kind of give us a stronger, you know, kind of punching through like, hey, check it out. We're coming in stronger. The principle of what you said is true. You okay. can strengthen your offer by putting in an increased deposit. Yes. The, the, the tactical aspect of what you said, I'm going to put in 3% and then add more. You could do that, but it won't be associated with liquidated damages because remember, liquidated damages is only up to 3%. Okay. A better application might be to a buyer that's struggling to come up with cash and they put in a weak deposit. A better application would say, what could you come up with now? Could you come up with 1%? All right, let's put in 1%. And in two weeks, could we get, or 17 days when all the contingencies are now due, right? Can we get another 2%? Yes, I can do that in 17 days. Okay, let's do that. That strengthens your offer and gives your client a little bit of time and that would all be within the liquidated damages, which is 3% of the purchase agreement. To exceed that, you could. Uh, and I've done that before. I just want to put on a strong front, right? Like, hey, here's 100 grand. I'll buy your house. Yeah. But in reality, only 3% is going to be held accountable. Yeah, I was looking at more of the aspect of, like you said, it's like, hey, I'll give you the 3%, but this is how serious we are. Because, you know, you got to rise above. You got the cream's got to float above, especially in this. You market. could do that, Mike. Yeah. You know, one thing you want to do with that, Mike, is you want to verify that liquidated damages because okay. the liquidated damages provision has to be incorporated into the agreement. It's there, but you got to initial it. And so you could totally do it that way. If you like, right. you bet. Just looking for options. Yeah. Like it's a great way to say I'm, I'm no joke. Yeah. And uh, now you also need to say, Buyer, if we got a problem, you got to you realize you're going to put a hundred grand in. I got to try to get that out of escrow, and that's not as simple as it sounds. And for those of you that have worked with me to get money out of escrow to a buyer back to a seller, and there's a dispute, it can be a little uh, a handful. Great question, Mike. Another question for you, I kind of went over um, on section F, this is balance of down payment. Yes. Is that going to auto-populate once you fill up kind of the rest like it currently does? Mike, it currently does that way. Okay. Yes. I, that's and what I mean. if you use this, uh, which Marcos mentioned earlier, I'm always an advocate of you using the cover sheet. And and so a lot of that will self-populate. Yes. Yeah, I've been doing the um, sky slope and you use the file details, fill it all in and it kind of populates over. For Cover you. sheet, file details. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Uh, sky slope didn't always include contracts. Matter of fact, if you've been with me a while, there was a time they had it, <laughs> they dropped it. I'm so glad to see that back in sky slope. Will um, we be able to print a copy of the, of this uh, sample contract? You bet, John. Um, what I did is I put in the link that I keep putting into the chat box, and I have two documents that are there. The same contract I walked you through is there. And the book on how this contract, it, it breaking down in further detail than what I had time to do today for this contract. Yeah, both are there in that link. I had another question on... Um... On L2 with the appraisal contingency based yes. on value, minimum, blah, blah. That's basically, um, explain that box to me a little bit more. Um, Give me the box again, Mike. L2, where it says appraisal, appraisal contingency based upon appraised value at minimum purchase price or. Ah, okay. I know exactly what I'm about. Yeah. And you, you kind of went into about gap on that. And I'm going yeah. to try to clarify. Yeah. 
because that is I've used that a few times. Gap's actually yeah. a couple of deals. Yeah, yeah. Uh, remember I and when I got to this part, I, I by the way, my personal observations is I really like this doc, this new form. Mm-hmm. I think it puts everything in one place in the grid, and I think it addresses some really big concerns that were vague. And this um, this does it. This is the one area I don't like. And I'm going to tell you why, Mike. We're in section. Are you seeing my screen, by the way? Yeah. See in section L2, it says appraisal. And it says appraisal contingency based on appraised value at a minimum of the purchase price. And then you got this section that says or. And the, the all I have to describe it is or. That's it. That's all I have. And then you could put another number in. What I really think is needed here is a paragraph that describes your appraisal bridge or the gap. If it appraises below my purchase price, we'll make up the difference, right? Like you could put that in there. What I don't think it does sufficiently is that when it appraises low, it doesn't define what the recourse and what the buyer is going to do and the details of that. And this is where I'm saying, and and it's the one area I've told you here that you kind of need an addendum because it's in the contract, remember that, not an amendment, and you need to have it drafted by the California Association of Realtors. They will give you the language pertaining to your client. You call them on the legal hotline and they'll say, here's what I want you to write. Because when you're doing escalation, when you're doing bridge, when you're covering the appraisal gap, there's just nothing of substance that really defines how we handle that. And it's the one area that I felt was missing clarity. Obviously, because even I was like, what does that mean? I didn't get it. That's, yeah. like said, I've used it a couple of times, so I'll probably definitely be having to reach out to somebody if I get into that. Position. Get an addendum and, um, and use that for the with California, call the legal hotline and they'll give you the, the language to use. Um, and you could do that. Now, another one would be an escalator clause, right? Like get the language from them. What's an escalator clause? I'll pay $5,000 more than the other offer you have. Get that language from them. If you type in escalator clause, you'll see a bunch of things from me in the Google, uh, uh, in the Facebook group on how to navigate the escalator clause. You can do it, just be careful with it, and they can help you do it. Yeah, John, go ahead. And then if we we called them once, would we be able to apply that verbiage to um, subsequent offers, or do we need to call every time? No, as long as your circumstance hasn't changed. Yep, as long. The idea behind having you call is because they want to, to talk to you about your particular client in those circumstances. You have the same circumstances, copy and paste it. But there are, it's likely, and the reason why I'm not giving you like a standard language for that, because your circumstances change. And I really don't want people copy and pasting that. And then your client doesn't have the money to make up the difference and we've got a dispute. So you almost have to do that based on your own individual client's unique situation. Plus, if we all start calling enough on the same thing, they might make the uh, adjustment to it, I would think. I I would have hoped that there'd be some additional commentary. Now, by the way, there's more in 8B, but I don't see, here's 8B on appraisal. I, I just don't think there's anything of substance here that describes what we're talking about. Yeah. Hey, Rick, it's Asus. Um, <clears throat> I want to chime in on the subject, and uh, I love the the teaching, by the way, today. And I think these contracts are, I, I mean, it's a change right now, but I think it's easier. It covers a lot. But this specific area is something that I had question marks about as well. And um, <clears throat> because the competitive state of the market right now, you are having to write that in. And previously, that was written in other terms. So if um, if I'm not mistaken, this new RPA doesn't have the box that says other terms, which is why we're attaching an addendum. If we're, if our, you know, um, our client's going to bring up X amount between the appraised value and the purchase price, correct? That is exactly what I'm saying, Jesus. Gotcha. There is insufficient language that defines how that operates. 
And this is where you would want to get an addendum with the language drafted by the California Association of Realtors to help you do that. And it's the one area on this purchase agreement that I felt was weak uh, and insufficient. I love so much of what they've done. I wish they would have provided that. Now, our Bay Area has been hotter than most markets across the, the state. So I could see why they don't want to do it, but it would have been very helpful here in the Bay Area. Okay, I'm down to just a couple of minutes. Uh, if you have any further questions, um, and just a reminder, if if you're here and you, you know, and, and we, we finished our call, our call uh, we're just answering questions. So if you got to go, you got to go. I, and that's totally cool. But I just wanted to hang out a few minutes because we covered so much. I think uh, the R, the section R, other terms, would that, be, I'm just trying to think, you know, not all agents are as good as our buyer's agents. So I'm thinking of other offers that I may receive as a listing agent. Yeah. Um, would other terms be a place where they may put stuff like that going forward? Because I've seen yeah. that in other terms currently. Yes, you certainly could. It's a great point, Jim. I say an addenda because, you know, you're, 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 this is limited in, in length. But if you type too much in this, it'll actually create that text overflow addendum for you. And um, CAR is probably going to give you a couple of paragraphs, is my guess, when you do that. But yes, Jim, you could actually put that in paragraph R. Not a problem at all. What do you think would look cleaner as far as? When you, you know presenting an offer, writing it in that, or actually taking the, the time. To... The thing I don't like about the text overflow addendum, uh, yeah, I think there's it's a good idea. It's a good good. We got to do it. But what happens is you start writing, and then it just goes the rest of it over to the text overflow addendum. And and I, if it was me, I would just have an addendum with that language included, so that they could. It's all listed in one paragraph. Read a note in RC addendum number blah blah blah. Yep, you would definitely want to do that, and you'd want to include that addendum. You remember that section I went through that talked about all the additional addendums that are available? And you'd want to check addendum one. Yeah, totally. 